Hey there, Magic players. Barry White from Magic on Tap. Little bonus YouTube content for you. As you know, we usually only do videos every Friday on the Magic Untap YouTube channel, but today is a special day because we have a special guest. Gavin Verhag, say hello. Hello, everybody. I am so happy to be here and talk with you all about Commander Legends as well as some other fun stuff happening in the Magic multiverse. So thank you, Barry, for having me on. Of course, Gavin. No, aside from Commander Legends, you've been a pretty busy man over there, Wizards of the Coast. Anything new going on for you? Well, a lot of new stuff I can't talk about yet. I cannot wait for you to see. But as far as some other upcoming stuff that I'm pretty stoked about is uh, next year we've got Time Spiral Remastered coming down the pipeline, which is a take on one of my favorite blocks of all time with a bunch of old frame cards. Which I know for old time players like you and me, it's something to get pretty excited about. So yeah, that is one that I think is going to be pretty sweet. Right now, I mean, I'm keeping folks on Commander Legends. That set really is my baby. It took almost six years uh, from the original idea to come out. But Time Spiral Remastered is something I'm pretty stoked for uh, coming into next year. Now, you mentioned that uh, Commander Legends right now is your baby and uh, a little kind of an into window joke, but it's there's truth in it. Babies are fun to make, aren't they? Yeah, well, fun, but also a lot of work, you know, a lot of checkups, a lot of, uh, a lot of very careful precision goes into it, redecorating the room, as right. it were, and it was, it took a long time to get here, but I'm so proud of the baby that we've created, and uh, I, I mean, the players are loving it, the reception early is really, really, really good, and my hope has always been that Commander Legends 1 would do good enough if we get a sequel to it, and certainly the early, early sales are looking very positive. Well, that's good. So Commander Legends, it did just come out uh, just a few days ago. It was past uh, Friday officially. Uh, it's fair to say that uh, the office is a little excited about this launch? If there was an office, we would be. You know, right now we're all working from home, but in the, the theoretical office is extremely right, excited about right. it. Right, The greater and, office. Uh, right, exactly. The worldwide office. And so many people who worked on this set. I mean, this set's been going on for so long. And there are so many people who are involved in the process at all legs. And, you know, a lot of people think about a set and they think about the card designers, but there are so many people that touch a set besides the card designers, right? I mean, there's the editing team, there's all the artists, there's the creative team. And this set had a lot of creative work to do with all the old characters. There's marketing, there's communications, there's production, there's, you know, all the stuff that goes into making the sets, all that and more. And everyone has put their fingerprint on this one if you worked on Magic pretty much in some way or another. So to have it finally come out is truly a celebration of our game. And as I keep saying, Commander Legends isn't just like a love letter to Commander. It's a love letter to Magic because there's stuff there, no matter how long you've been playing, you will look at the set and probably see something that puts a smile on your face. Now, something I've kind of wondered here is, uh, if you could tell me, uh, how did the whole idea of Commander Legends even come up? Was somebody kind of like, you know what would be cool, Commander but for draft, I mean, what, was there a conversation? Was it just a thought over lunch? How, how did it come about? Yeah, so, you know, I love to travel, so I'm always going around to magic events. And I was up not too far away from where I live here in Seattle, up in Vancouver at a Grand Prix in the year 2015. And I would just, just went up for the day. It was kind of almost a last minute choice. And I uh, met up with my friend Jeremy Petter. Now, Jeremy is a former, or still an active member, but doesn't do as much as he used to, of Loading Ready Run. And uh, he loves, you know, kind of social multiplayer formats. And that weekend, he had brought a bunch of Conspiracy to play. That was his hot new thing. And Conspiracy, it was like fresh and pretty new at the time, I think maybe under six months old. And we were talking about all the other things you would kind of do here. And we're talking about our favorite formats. And he said his favorite format was Commander. And I said it was Draft. And it just hit me, like, wait a second. Commander draft that could be so awesome together, and so I spent you know the weekend just asking people about it. He's like, oh, what do you think about Commander draft and getting thoughts about um, their take on the format, and it just didn't leave my head. So when I came back to the office on Monday, I was I asked Ethan Fleischer and Sean Main, who who were sat next to me at the time, what do you think about this? And they both really liked it, and so I started working on a prototype from that point. And then you know after a few months, we played the prototype. That went over really well. And then, um, you know, from there, this, the path was kind of set to make it go forward. But really, you know, I like to think this idea started with players who love the format. Like it was me hanging out at a Grand Prix talking with friends and realizing that there was something here. And then I slowly cultivated it over many years into the full-on booster set we see today. And you weren't just working on this on its own. You had Battle Bond at the time. You were working on the other annual Commander set. So it's not like you were just working on Commander Legends while you were working on Commander Legends. Right. So this set, 
you know, it was kind of just one of my side projects for a long time. And it was like, when I have some time, when I have an hour, I'll tweak it up, you know, I'll put some, some stuff into the file. And that was to get the prototype ready to go. Mm -hmm. So then I got this prototype ready, like I mentioned, and I played it with Ethan and Sean and a guy named James Hada. And we, it went really, really well. And then I slowly like tweaked it and played it with more and more people until I got to what I kind of viewed as like the end boss, which was Aaron Forsyth and Mark Gottlieb and uh, Mark Globus, who were like the people who were kind of the stakeholders for new products. And we played it and they all had a great time. Like I think Aaron drafted this deck with a bunch of flame tongue kavus and like bouncing them back to his hand and it felt great. It was super cool. Oh, that's loved old it. school, flame tongue kavu. Oh yeah, it, was, it, was, it looked a little bit different back then. It was super fun. <laughs> but the problem was we finished it and uh, finished that play test. And they're like, we, we all love this, but we have nowhere to put it. So it was kind of put on the back burner for a while. And then we did the infamous R&D hackathon. And the hackathon was an event that brought us a number of different products. Little teams broke off to kind of make their own products. And it brought us uh, Modern Horizons. It brought us Jumpstart. But I also pitched Commander Legends for it. And it, I kind of it was cheating a little bit because like I had a running head start, right? I had worked on this prototype for years and had people already know that they liked it. And so we got the week to work on it. And unsurprisingly, by the end of the week, I pitched it. We had iterated on a bunch and everyone loved it. And it was greenlit for production. So. Uh, even though it was, uh, it just goes to show how long we've been working on this though, right? I mean, it's the same thing that gave us Modern Horizons and Jumpstart, which are both already long out. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, now this is coming here. I guess, I guess kind of pays to work ahead a little bit sometimes, huh? Yeah, yeah, we work pretty far in advance. <laughs> so uh, now I know you, uh, Gavin, you led design with uh, Jules Robbins heading up development. Uh, how did your collective teams come up with which magic characters got reprints, which ones got reimagined, and which, kind of like uh, Hans Ericsson, uh, which 9 out of 10, Legoyfs agree, is a good needle on the run. Uh, how did they all make their debut in the set? Yeah, so really early on in the process, I talked to the creative team. And, you know, I had the great fortune with this set. Uh, like, I'm a huge creative group. Like, I love all the old stories. Like, this is just like you, Barry. I grew up with a lot of oh, these yeah. great characters. Love them. Super, love them. super into them. Um, but as big of a flavor guy as I am, I cannot hold a candle to the likes of Ethan Fleischer and Kelly Diggs, who are truly magic creative masterminds. Ethan owns a copy of, I think, basically every piece of magic fiction ever written. We did a video together where uh, every printed form of magic media, he showed me his bookshelf with all of it and his, you know, his comic books and all that stuff. It was really cool. And so uh, uh, early on, we started talking like, hey, what would be the cool legends to, to do here? And it came back to me with a list. I still have had that list at my desk at work. It's a couple pages long now. I've made some hand alterations, but right. it's a list of all the good legends we could use here. And uh, many of the legends in the set came from that initial list. And we looked for both characters who had never had a card, which was a big one to start with. But then also, as we, as we started honing in, there are a lot of characters who had cards that the cards were kind of lackluster. And yeah. could we do another cooler version of the card? So we looked at doing some of those. And, you know, for some of them, it ranged from as long of stories as like Belby, who had, you know, more or less an entire book where she was a huge character, mm -hmm. all yes, the way Ronhold to Tormod. Yeah. Right, exactly, from Nemesis, all the way to Torment, Nemesis. or uh, sorry, excuse me, Tormod, where um, the entire information we had about Tormod was has a crypt. That's it. That's all the info we had, right? So there was a really wide range, but uh, working with the creative team to figure those out early was great. And then, we kept, then from there, you know, um, it was kind of a matter of just designing top-down characters to fit what we were looking for. And then as I handed off to Jules for development, he then took those characters and refined them, kept most of them, cut a few of them, and worked with creative to add a few others. So it was a, definitely a team effort on both my end and Jules' end, along with the creative team. There was a zombie, had a crypt, and Tormod was his name. Okay, no, that was stupid. <laughs> you know, so, it's, it, on Dominaria, it's a classic Necromancer nighttime song. You gotta love it. All right, I, I believe that uh, the, uh, the parents and the Benalia even sing that to the children at night. Yeah, just, just to scare them a little bit. Keep them right. awake slightly. You know? Right, it's like their version of, the, uh, uh, of those uh, Grimm Brothers fairy tales, right? The, the, the actual ones, not the Disney versions. <laughs> Right. Now, yeah, don't do this or you'll return in sea foam forever. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, you mentioned the list, uh, uh, not the list, but your list of, of could be and would be legendary creatures from Magic's history. Now, while you can't fit every single one of Magic the Gathering's yet unprinted characters into any one set, why did some of the game's characters, like Ashnod, Gix, Pharaohs, and the like, not make the cut, whereas others did? Yeah, you know, I, it's funny you mentioned Ashton and Gix because those are two that were in my original file that I really wanted to make it through. And a number of other characters. I, I'm a huge Kamigawa fan, and there were a number of characters in the Kamigawa story uh, that did not make it through, like uh, Kyodai, the, 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 the twins, uh, for mm -hmm. example. 
Um, ultimately, it just I handed a lot of them off to Jules, and there's only so many space for legends in the set. Um, and some of them could survive, and some of them didn't survive. And, uh, you know, when it comes to stuff like Ashnod, there was a design that we liked, but it just wasn't doing what the set needed to do. And we would rather wait and print it, um, you know, uh, at another point in time. Another challenge we actually ran into, which um, is not one you necessarily think about, is at some point we, we realized that um, most of the set was humanoid legends. And in talking with the creative team, they were like, we actually, like, just looking at, at the artists of it we have available and looking at like, the, how we want our legendary characters to look in our lineup, we, need, we should probably have fewer humanoids, right? Because we have more, we have a lot of artists who are good at different things. Not everyone is good at drawing humans. Right. And we also just want to have a wide range of characters. When you look at all the legends in the set, you have your ooze, right? You have all your weird and quirky stuff. And so some of them had to go. And, you know, like I said, I handed off Ashnod and Gix and some of those folks. Jules ended up uh, trimming them down. Um, but ultimately, there's only so much room in the set, right? If I wanted to include all the legends everyone wanted, the set would be four times as large. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's tricky. I hope, that's why I hope we do a number two, right? And in number two, maybe we'll see some of these guys. It sounds like were there to be a number two, you already have a handful already, at least in theory, made just waiting for a spot. If, if I could make a Commander Legends 2, uh, I think entirely out of just legends people have asked for that aren't in the set that's how many there are right like when you think about magic's backlog there are so many beloved characters that we can either redo or give cards to for the first time that i'm really not worried about running out not to mention you know you're, you can make plenty of great new characters too so there's a lot of great stuff we can still do we use a lot of them here but there's still enough for for a second go around I think. well if you consider that just me personally um i've been waiting for uh, a Jaya card, and then I didn't uh, finally got one in Time Spiral, and then I wanted the Jaya Planeswalker, and I had to wait until Dominaria. Same thing with Joda, one of my all time favorite characters from the Mark Grubb books back in, I, I want to say 98, 99 when those books came out. I didn't get a card until Dominaria, so I know it really can take some time, and sometimes just it needs to be the right fit. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you look at what we're going for with the set and how it it's played out in limited. It's important that like you know things match up to limited archetypes, or they match up the themes, or you know we only have so many slots, right? Like you know if if there's a black red legend we want to do, well there's only so much room for black red legends, and at some point you got to kind of pick pick which ones are in the, in the set. So um, I full confidence we'll see some of these characters, Ashnod, Gix, maybe even Pharaohs uh, someday. But uh, just uh, this set was not the place. Someday, someday, <laughs> someday. I will say though, I I was really tickled to see uh, the Planeswalker Tev Shtep. Uh, in the set, my favorite, and you can laugh all you want, Gavin, my favorite set of all time is actually Fallen Empires. It's a little bit because it was my, my first new release I ever got to experience personally. Uh, I began playing in the dark. The dark had already released at that point. So for me, Fallen Empires was my first launch. So I, it's a little bit of nostalgia. For, it's actually a lot a bit nostalgia for me, but it also has some really cool artwork like on uh, Susan Van Camp's Hand of Torok and what have you. So I was so happy to see that the Planeswalker that actually um, heralds from Dominaria's island of Sephardia, Tevshet, is in this set and harkens back to the Fallen Empire themes and mechanics with thrills and whatnot. I think that was an excellent flavor win for me. Yeah, there's a lot of very tiny nods like the, that that we did. And I think even years from now, you can look back at things in this set and be like, oh, I never noticed that before. That's a really cool reference. And I designed Tevis Thought, so I'm glad, glad you enjoyed it. And I'll say that a lot of the process for making many of the legends early on, at least, was just read about the character, figure out what would make sense for them to do. And uh, with Tevish, yeah, Thrills were, were a natural fit for him. Mm -hmm. um, with the Planeswalkers in particular, like early on, we identified we wanted to do Planeswalkers and that it would make sense to do them as partners here. Um, given that we partner was in the set and we had never done just partner planeswalkers before. Of course, we had done partner with ones with uh, Rowan and Will, but not actually partner. And so um, I asked creative, and pretty quickly they came back with Jessica and Tavish Zot. And uh, from there it was, it was you know, smooth sailing on refining the cards. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, if there is a Commander uh, Legends 2, which honestly I kind of hope to see one here uh, before too long, well, enough time to get it made at least, uh, you guys have a wealth more Planeswalkers between new and old walkers that you can easily uh, cherry pick from and, and make a lot of people happy and still leave people wanting. Yeah, I know people have asked for the Urza Planeswalker card in Black Border, not just Urza's head, for a very <laughs> long time. And you, know, you can do all kinds of fun stuff like that. I want to do, I've got a bunch of wacky old ones I want to do, like uh, green sleeves. I would like love Commodore a green Guff. sleeves. Uh, Commodore Guff is my, my white whale. 
Like, I would love to get a Kamara guard golf made. I don't know if it'll ever happen, but that one is, is one that I'm super interested in. Even, you know, going back to some old walkers like Warzel and Thawmill from mm-hmm. the original Alpha story, right? Like, there's stuff like that is, uh, is super fun. All right. Well, um, kind of shifting gears here, Gavin, I want just for a, a moment while I still have you here, talk Color Pie, if you don't mind. So staying a bit with uh, the car design and set design, I know Color Pie, kind of the de- determination of what color does what, for what reason is a key element. So does sticking to the Color Pie present a challenge when developing and designing these new cards? You know, the, the color pie is a blessing and a curse in a lot of ways. Like, it's super important that it exists because um, it really helps make sure that the game feels different, right? You don't want every color to do all the same stuff all the time because otherwise it starts to look like a big mishmash. And traditionally, when we've done sets that have, like, meshed the colors together, it's created um, some soupy uh, style uh, gameplay. Now, uh, with Commander in particular, I, you know, recently there has been the challenge brought up by a number of players that s- n- not everything is done or the key things that are good in Commander are not done equally for everybody. And Commander, of course, is traditionally about card drawing and mana ramp. And white, in particular, is the color which lacks good card drawing and good mana ramp, for the most part. So we've taken an eye to working on that, and there's a little bit in Commander Legends, you're kind of getting you know, your first, first taste of a lot of it here, and there's more coming out in future sets. You know, In this set, we've got stuff like Keeper of the Accord, for, for example, being one card that can help uh, white ramp up its mana. Um, there's some sources of card advantage, like the, I don't remember the name, but the four mana, three, three flyer, that um, uh, gives you an aura equipment from the top of, of your library when you attack with it. There's some amount of that, and then there's more uh, in the sets to come. So I, we actively know it's something we need to work on in the case of white for commander. And, um, you know, it's going to be a slow process, but there is plenty of stuff coming out to, to help them. Um, uh, but, yeah, you know, in general, a color pie, I usually find helpful creatively to work with because it really gives you structure for designing your cards. I was actually going to ask you about white because people have been getting more and more vocal lately about, hey, white doesn't have this, white doesn't have that, white's not competitive enough. Um, how long does it take between identifying something like that and getting feedback on something like that and actually getting it to the point to where players will notice? How much time would that, would that take or you know, can that take? Yeah, well, you know, when you consider we work usually a year and a half to two years ahead on sets so as a bare minimum. Um, and then consider that in the case of something like White and Commander, it's not going to happen in one set. Like, we're not going to be like, hey, here's a set with 15 new White cards that are must plays. Because first of all, I don't think anybody necessarily wants that. Like we can make 15 cards we think are must plays in Commander, but until we know what works and what doesn't work, and what players like and what they don't like, if we do it all at the same time, there's a huge risk that we'll actually create problems as opposed to solve problems. Um, and so it's going to be more of a trickle over time. Now I am really sensitive to the discussion people have brought up about you need to make sure white gets things at a good clip because otherwise every color will continue to outpace white. So yeah. I totally agree we need to, to fuel up what white is doing, give them some extra gas. And I, there's some stuff in upcoming sets that I do think will help out with this. Um, but, you know, there's also just like we think some things will hit, but we don't know for sure. And um, we kind of have to wait until see the rubber hits until the rubber hits the road on some of this stuff. Um, I will say, since all the discussions with Commander Legends have started, I have gone back into files with people and buffed several white cards. So uh, there is definitely uh, it's been an extra little fire under my under fire under me to make stuff happen. But uh, we were doing it already anyway. So we'll see we'll see how th- how things turn out. But it's definitely a high priority for I think everyone in design at this point. So it's not just that Wizards is, is hearing and acknowledging uh, what, what players are saying, the feedback they're getting. You uh, have already gone in and actually made some changes to try to rectify this in the future. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's you know, uh, there's a couple things that we've done. One is just, you know, improve the power level of some of the upcoming white cards. There's a few suggestions that were given online, which I thought were, were pretty good um, and that we took into account and discussed. But I think the other one and a, a point that I was really sensitive to from Commander Legends is uh, there are some people who are feeling like other colors were getting things that white got access to, right? With Hull Breacher and mm-hmm. Opposition Agent, which helps strip it, which, you know, can strip away white's color identity. Um, now, I will continue, I have said, I will continue to say that the cards Hull Breacher and the cards Opposition Agent are blue and black cards, respectively. Like, black does not steal things from your opponent's library. If you're going to make those cards, they are those colors. That said, I, I am sensitive and do agree that we should be careful with how other colors are stepping on the space. And even though Opposition Agent may be black, it's unclear that card needed to exist in the form that it did. So, uh, yeah, there are some future cards. There's at least one card that pops into my head right now that we color shifted um, pretty late on, frankly, 
um, to help make sure that, uh, that it wouldn't creep into white space. And when that card comes out, I will tell that story. It's going to be a little while, but um, yeah, there's already some changes like that that we've been making. So we're very conscious of it. Um, I know we're going to keep getting messages about it for a long time to come because it's not going to be a fast process. But if you look at red, right, that's the example I use, where 10 years ago when Commander started, red was also really weak. Yeah. And we really focused on red, making red better and better and better, giving it things like the impulsive draw mechanic, giving it more ways of having card advantage, giving it more ways to impact um, the overall board and have long game longevity of more variety of commanders. And red is really coming into its own now, I think. And, you know, a lot of people view red as like a, a pretty reasonable commander color to play. Um, white, of course, is still totally reasonable. Like there's plenty of strong white decks. I have a mono white commander deck. Right, absolutely. But the, just those two key elements, card drawn ramp, is how a lot of folks like to play. And uh, making sure that there's, there's some of that around um, in some capacity, I think will be important. So like I said, you'll see it slowly over time appear um, in various ways. We're going to try a lot of stuff out and you're just going to have to stay tuned for, uh, for what that is. All right. Well, Gavin, I didn't only bring you here to talk about uh, Commander Legends and Color Pie and, and Magic the Gathering Insider Talk. I also brought you here to play a game we're calling Magic Related. I'm going to ask you three Ooh. Magic Related multiple choice questions may or may not actually be about Magic the Gathering. Gavin, are you up for this? You uh, get two out, of three, uh, two out of three of these questions, right? You get one internet point. Sound good? <laughs> wow. I need to add to my collection of internet points. Oh, let's do this thing. Yeah. Okay, so I got them right here for you. First off, Elijah Bamberg, Holland's court magician in the late 1700s, was credited at the time with performing the most unbelievable magic tricks. How? Was it A, he lost a leg in a war and had his artificial leg fitted with secret compartments, allowing him to, conform, to perform his amazing, amazing magic effects. B, he would wait until the entire court was really, really drunk. Or C, he was actually a descendant from the wizard Merlin. Wow. All, 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 three, all three solid answers. I, I, I would be happy if any of these were true, frankly. Um, especially if Merlin was real. That'd be sweet. I guess, wow. And you see that it was in Holland? Holland in the late 1700s. Holland in the late 1700s? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to go with, ooh, I really want the wooden leg one to be true, but I'm not sure if that's what they would have in the 1700s from a war in Holland. Mm, I don't know. I'm going to go with the drunk. I'm going to go with, with B. It was actually A. He actually lost was the a, war. It was A. He, yeah. Uh, yeah, he lost his leg in the war, and because he uh, worked in the royal court, he had access to... Uh, to more than just a, a saw, and they made him a false leg to stand on. He had a custom made with hollow components uh, or compartments and drawers, and he was able to hide things in his legs to or in, in his hollow leg to make the uh, tricks work. That is so awesome! That is so <laughs> right? awesome. Kudos to him. What a what a great way to turn that um, turn that loss of a leg into a pretty cool uh, job yeah, ahead of his time. Ahead of his, or I guess you could say he had a leg up on the magicians. Yeah, there you go. Ah. There you go. All right, uh, question two. Vaudevillian magician Jack Nor Norworth is probably better known writing lyrics to one of the most well-known songs in American culture. Which song is it? He wrote Sweet Caroline as a poem in 1928, which Neil Diamond would later put to music. B, he wrote Take Me Out to the Ball Game in 1908, 32 years before actually watching his first Major League Baseball game. Or C, he wrote the lyrics to crooner Frank Sinatra's first hit, Polka Dots and Moonbeams. Wow. Um, truly have no idea, but I'm thinking about vaudeville, and I'm going to go with Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Uh, you're right. going to go with Take Me Out to the Ball Game, and you would be right. And Hooray. Yeah, uh, more than three decades before he would actually see his first baseball game. Wow, that is really, really impressive. Yeah, bit. Well, I, okay, I, I got two. I got two, I got one right. I got one wrong. It's all about this third question. It's all about this. This is for the whole kit and caboodle and that internet point. I know you covet. I absolutely okay. want to win that internet point. Absolutely. Question three: Some magicians have gained fame even while being physically challenged. Which of the following is a true story? Admiral Tom Thumb was a midget magician who worked for Ringling Brothers Circus and sold his own magic sets, complete with tiny playing cards. B, 
Argentinian magician René Levan became famous for his amazing card magic, even though he only had one arm. Or C, Richard Turner, considered to be among the world's greatest card magicians despite being blind, is so good at what he does that the U.S. playing card company uses him to test the quality of their playing cards. Can you repeat number one to me again? A is Admiral Tom Thumb, who was a midget magician working for Ringling Brothers Circus, sold his own magic sets complete with tiny cards. I do, you know, I love any man who does sell his own magic sets. I got to say, that's, that's a nice one. Uh, and who, who's the, what was the name of the person in the third one? That would be Richard Turner. Richard Turner? A I'm going to go, go with C. You're going to go with C? Well, go Gavin, with C. I have good news for you. All three of them were real. They oh, all right. actually happened. So you, uh, you get your one internet point. All right, I'll have to bank that one, put that in the bank, make it two <laughs> internet points in about 10 years. Right, right. Well, maybe the professor or, uh, or a load ready run or one of them can help you out with the second one. <laughs> <laughs> you just need two internet points to rub together, you know? Right, right. But you can give your two internet cents. Ah, there we go. Well, I already lost all those. Ah, yeah. No, 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 no more cents left. They all, they all went into creating these uh, wonderful magic sets that you have had your, uh, your uh, hands and fingers on uh, since you joined Wizards of the Coast. And uh, Gavin, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for uh, joining us here on Magic Untapped. Well, thank you very much for having me. It was a blast. And I hope everyone out there is enjoying Commander Legends. If you have any questions at all, you can always hit me up on Twitter at Gavin Verhan. There you go. 